Good afternoon, everyone. So today, 14 November, as we celebrate Children's Day, today also is World Diabetes Day. So we at Nanavati Hospital will be talking about what is diabetes, how to conquer the major question which people encounter us. So I will be giving a brief, uh, brief description of what is diabetes. Diabetes is a chronic metabolic disorder which occurs due to prolonged high sugars. And why does high sugar occur or why does a person develop diabetes? Diabetes occurs to pancreas not producing enough insulin or the cells in the body are not able to react to the insulin produced. So, what are the complications of it and how, and how do we deal about it? So, we have with us expert on our panel team, Dr. Girish Parma, the endocrinologist working at Nanavati Hospital, will tell us about how to deal with it. So, sir, so your opinion about it. What is diabetes? As everyone asks us, and we deal with it every day. I think, uh, I guess by now, everyone knows what diabetes is. It's nothing but a state of high glucose levels. And whenever your blood glucose levels are above a threshold, we say you tend to develop diabetes or you've got diabetes or pre-diabetes. So, uh, if the sugar levels are high, then obviously that leads to complications because the blood becomes thick and the flow becomes slow. And therefore, it's not diabetes per se, it's the complications of diabetes which eventually kills a person and therefore, people are more and more scared of diabetes. So, what are the complications we know about and how do we how do we, the patient should be warned about it? So, if you look, uh, when we talk of diabetes, as I mentioned to you, that it's nothing but uh, thickening of blood and therefore reducing its blood flow. And as we all know that glucose is sticky and if the glucose levels in the blood are high, it sticks on the inner side of the blood vessel. Now, blood vessel can be small and large. Obviously, if the glucose is sticking to the inner side of the blood vessel, along with this, you have cholesterol which gets deposited. Along with cholesterol, you have calcium which gets deposited. So initially, the person may not complain of any symptoms. In fact, as a matter of fact, 50% of diabetics do not even have any symptoms at the time of diagnosis. So they don't even have, they are not even aware of diabetes that they have it, unless and until they check it. So initially, they don't have any complaints. But overall, as time passes, because the blood becomes thick and then there's slow and steady obstruction of the blood vessels, then you start to develop complications. They are broadly classified into two, microvascular and macrovascular. Micro means small and macro means large. So microvascular means small vessel clogging and uh, macrovascular means large vessels when clogged can lead to complications. The other question everyone asks, what type of a diabetes a person has? The type 1 or the type 2? How will we diagnose and how will we differentiate the person? Okay, in the good old days, you know, diabetes used to be classified as insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent. But now that classification is obsolete. And now broadly we classify diabetes as type 1 or type 2. Now type 1 is a state wherein your body does not produce any insulin. Obviously if the body is not producing insulin then your sugar levels are going to be high. Now just to give you an understanding what why one develops high sugar. See normally whenever you eat whatever food you consume everything in the body gets converted into glucose except water so even if you're having fatty food or you're having proteins part of it gets converted into glucose this is because your brain can use only glucose for energy purposes so whatever food you consume goes to the stomach <coughs> gets broken down goes to the intestine gets converted into glucose and this glucose from the intestine goes into the bloodstream now, in the bloodstream, this glucose is of no value. It needs to be transferred from the bloodstream into the cell where it can be utilized for energy purposes. Am I right? So, this transfer of glucose from the bloodstream into the cell is done by a hormone called insulin. Insulin is produced by a gland called as pancreas, which is located just behind the stomach. So, as soon as food enters the stomach, signals go to the pancreas via the nerves. And you start manufacturing insulin because very soon this food is going to get converted into glucose and then if insulin is there it can transfer this glucose from the bloodstream into the cells which need it obviously if the cells get glucose they function very well so this is normal physiology also understand that part of this glucose 
under the influence of insulin is stored in the liver because at night when you are not eating and you need energy this glucose which is stored in the liver comes out so this is what normal physiology is which happens in an individual now as we were talking about diabetes and type 1 and type 2 you need to understand that type 1 diabetes is a condition where the pancreas does not produce insulin obviously if insulin is not being produced then whatever you consume gets converted to glucose and stays in the bloodstream for a longer time the cells do not get enough vis a vis type 2 diabetes which normally happens which is the most commonest form of diabetes in a in in a country or probably worldwide this happens because your body produces insulin but that insulin is not adequate in the sense most of individuals with type 2 diabetes are usually obese they have more of fat around the waistline and it is this fat which does not allow insulin to act so your body is producing insulin but the fat absorbs it but does not allow the insulin to act and if insulin is not able to act obviously the transfer of sugar from the blood stream into the cells is not going to take place and therefore the sugar levels in the blood is going to go up and you will develop diabetes so if you see type 1 is absolute deficiency of insulin whereas type 2 is relative deficiency of insulin if you see type 1 diabetes usually happens in kids it accounts for about 2 to 5 percent of the overall diabetic population depending upon the country that you start staying in if you see type 2 diabetes, type 2 is the most common form of diabetes which usually happens in 95% of the population. So it's usually seen in 5th, 6th decade but in India we see it in 4th and 5th decade and nowadays we are seeing it in quite young people also. So type 2 is in adults, type 1 is in kids. Usually type 1 are individuals or kids who are very lean and thick vis a -vis type 2 are usually very obese. So as you said, type 2 diabetes is more because of the sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. So type 2 diabetes can be reversed or the lifestyle modification will help the patients? If you ask type 1, obviously type 1 as of now is not reversible and since the body is not producing insulin, these kids are directly put on insulin. Whereas type 2, yes definitely it is reversible in the initial phases. So the whole problem type 2 arises because of excess fat around the waistline, around the belly. So if you cut down that fat, obviously the opposition to insulin reduces and obviously your body, whatever insulin it manufactures, is able to execute its action and the sugar levels can come down. What's the impact of exercise as well as diet? Both can produce help on type 2 patients with diabetes? Yes, that's. Uh, I think if you ask me, uh, diabetes per se, it's high glucose levels, right? So, and glucose comes from food, and obviously, if you cut down your food, then the glucose consumption also reduces. And obviously, when you exercise, then your muscles are consuming or utilizing that glucose. So, but obvious that your glucose levels will normalize or diabetes will reverse if you do rigorous exercise and if not rigorous at least 30 to 45 minutes of exercise every day maybe five days a week along with controlling your diet and calories and obviously so as the patients always ask so if the type 2 diabetes is reversible the so answer to it is yes yes it is very well reversible you just need to lose weight it's the fat around the belly which is the cause of type 2 diabetes okay what is the diet we recommend okay diet is a big big chapter if you uh so you see, nowadays, if, if I was to say that we all are trying to focus on this diet, that diet, XYZ diet, we are talking of Mediterranean diet, we are talking of uh, you know reducing low carb diet or keto diet, we are talking of low fat diet. It is not the diet which is important, what kind of food. I would say we should have a balance of carbohydrate, proteins and fat all three together because our body needs it so all forms of diet can work in the short term long run there are problems with diet so i would say it's your calories which you're consuming which is most important thing and obviously the calories which you're burning if you're consuming less and burning more you'll obviously utilize your deposits which you have and therefore therefore 
your weight will come down, opposition to insulin will come down, and therefore your diabetes will reverse. Definitely. Okay. Do we have any guidelines or anything when the patient should diagnose their self for diabetes or when they realize they have diagnosed symptoms or how to go? When should they examine? So, so you know, uh, diagnosis or screening, when one should go in for test, obviously, see, as I said earlier, that 50% of the population does not, those who are diabetics do not even know that they have diabetes unless and until they check it. So one should check it periodically. Who are the individuals who should check it? Okay, if you look at guidelines, what the American guidelines say is that anyone above the age of 40, but I would not restrict that to any age limit because in India, we are much more prone because of our ethnicity, because of our racial background. Because if you look at Americans versus Asians or Indians, we are more prone to develop diabetes and we are more prone to develop it at a much earlier age. The reason is because if you look for a same BMI, a Western versus an Indian, we have more fat around the waistline. But if you look at Americans or Westerns, they are stocky all throughout. Their fat mass is distributed all over. Whereas we have more fat around the belly. And it is the belly fat which is uh, really the positive fat. So that's why we are more prone. So if you ask me in India, you should get it done if you are overweight or obese. If you have a strong family history or if you think you have symptoms, symptoms, what are the symptoms that one experiences? That brings me to the point. Okay, so usually most of them are asymptomatic. And if you are having symptoms, that means the levels of sugars are more than probably 250 plus. That's because when your glucose levels exceeds that threshold, obviously this glucose is present in blood and the cells are not getting enough energy. If the cells are not getting energy, then you'll feel exhausted, fatigued, lethargic quite easily, quite early. Another thing is because this glucose from the bloodstream enters into the urine, and in the urine, this sugar lacks water. So the frequency of urination will increase. Frequency of urination will increase, you're losing more water in the urine, so you'll feel more thirsty. And because the cells are not getting energy, the muscles shiver, so your weight comes down, so a person tends to lose weight. So if you're losing weight, which is unexplained, you're feeling more hungry, you're feeling more thirsty, you're passing urine quite frequently, then definitely you need to go in. Or even if you're asymptomatic, but you're not heavier side, if you're overweight, obese, if you have a strong family history, irrespective of your age, one should definitely check. Okay, a woman who has type 1 diabetes, can she conceive normally? A woman who has type, type 1. Type one. Yes, definitely. Definitely, a type 1 individual can also live a normal, healthy life. In fact, to most of my patients, or probably I don't like to use the word patient, but most of the people who come to me, whether it's type 1 or type 2, they can live a normal, healthy life. Just presence of type 1 diabetes does not indicate that you are handicapped. You know, there are a lot of famous celebrities and personalities who have type 1 diabetes and they excel in their field. If you look uh, abroad, people with type 1 diabetes live up to the age of 60s and 70s also. Why in India there is so much? At India, usually people, uh, the highest that I've seen type 1 diabetes is about 58, 60. That's my experience per se. But in India, if you look, uh, what happens is, uh, as I said, the control is important. How well you control diabetes, or how low you keep your glucose levels. Is it lack of patient knowledge? No, it is a mixture of everything. It's not just patient knowledge. Patients are also quite educated nowadays, at least in metropolitan cities like Mumbai. But uh, type one diabetes, you know, the insulin production in their body is not there, right? But normally, your body is producing insulin continuously, irrespective of your meals, whether you eat or not. And in response to your meals, the body produces bursts of insulin. Now, the amplitude of the burst would depend on the carbohydrate content of the meal. So, your body is continuously producing insulin, and then in response to the meal, it produces insulin. This is the normal physiological way of producing insulin in a person's body. Now, in a type 1, their body is not producing insulin. So, what do we do? We give insulin from outside. Now, insulin is an injectable preparation. 
So I cannot inject insulin every minute or every hour. So what we do is compensation. So we modify the preparation of insulin so that they can work for 4 hours, 6 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours or 24 hours. So we probably advise patients in India to take insulin maybe 4 pricks or 5 pricks a day. But imagine for a person to take 4 or 5 pricks a day is not really practical. So we try and compensate 2 pricks or 3 pricks. And that probably in that bargain we miss the boat because the glucose control is not optimal. If you look at western world, uh, any every type 1 diabetic is given an insulin pump. Pump is nothing but an insulin delivery device which delivers insulin continuously into your body. That unfortunately does not happen in India because it's not covered by insurance. So cost is the prohibitive factor. But then, uh, when, when one can invest in a car, 3 lakhs, 5 lakhs, why not in a pump? So, if you ask me, that's a good way of taking insulin, especially in a type 1 diabetic. I'm not advising all type 2 diabetics, but type 1 definitely, pump is a better way of taking pumps. And obviously, if the glucose levels are well maintained, then anyone can live a normal lifespan as well as conceive. Okay. We have a question from Ms. Neha Vajpayee. What are the risks of using the artificial sweeteners we have available in the market? Like N numbers have come down. Okay, but there are a lot of artificial sweeteners. And can they, they be used by the patients? Well, with the uh, width of kidney, the donors and everything, patients who have. So, artificial sweeteners, obviously, one would like to taste whatever they eat should be sweet because it gives you a sense of reward. So, whatever you consume, most of them. Would prefer to have sweet. Now in diabetes, obviously we don't prefer adding sugar to a great extent. So one can substitute that with artificial sweeteners, no doubts about it. But remember, these artificial sweeteners are also chemicals. So if they, they're taken in large quantities, at least animal studies have shown that they are carcinogenic. So probably artificial sweeteners should be taken, should or can be taken. But in very limited quantity, maybe one or two grams max per day, depending upon which sweetener you are using. So, do you recommend any or any of So, stevia is a good option. I think it's a plant derived uh, natural sweetener. So, usually, most of the patients I recommend uh, to take stevia. We have one question from Mona Lisa. Is an allergy a sign of diabetes? Not, no, not necessary. You can, one can be allergic to many things. It's not necessarily indicative of uh, high glucose levels. Uh, so, Ria Shushmita, can I get rid of type 2 diabetes, stop eating carb or any lose a lot of weight as we have discussed already about this? So, you know, uh, again, talking about uh, Sushmita's questions brings me to the point, you know, since we were talking of diet, diet. whether one should go in for a low carb diet or one should go for a low fat diet. I think at the end of it, obviously, uh, technically, scientifically, low carb diet sounds good because obviously carbohydrates are nothing but getting converted into glucose. If I reduce my carbohydrates, obviously my glucose levels is going to come down, right? Well, low carb diet in the short run will not only help you in reducing your glucose levels, also help you in reducing your weight also. But maintenance of a low carb diet for a lifetime is very very difficult and obviously low carb diet in the long run for years together probably has an effect on the mind and the kidneys okay so i would say these are all uh, what we are trying to do is find shortcuts by manipulating your diet okay i think uh, i always tell you know my ancestors and our ancestors especially from india if you look they used to live up to the age of 80, 90, 100, probably centenarians also. Good old days. In spite of delivering maybe about 10 kids, they used to cross 80, 90. And what, what was their diet? Full of wheat. Nowadays people say wheat is bad. So I'm not too sure. But I think at least my ancestors used to have that. The problem is we are looking, trying to manipulate the diet, trying to find shortcuts. But what about exercise? No one is talking about that. I think exercise should be an integral part of your lifestyle. You know, we don't find, we always try and find the excuses of not to exercise. But I think the biggest 
and the most important part is exercise. Nowadays we don't have time. We play cricket even on a mobile. We don't go out to the fields, right? You want to play cricket or any game? It's the mobile. Exercise is something one should probably work on more than the diet. Is what I feel. Okay, my grandparents have diabetes. Was it at risk of me getting diabetes? Yeah. So hereditary. obviously, if you look, type one diabetes is not hereditary. Type 1 diabetes, the risk of type 1 running into families is much, much less. Whereas type 2 diabetes is usually hereditary. But it all depends on when did the parents have it or when did the grandparents have it. At what age did they have it? What was the weight at that time? Usually type 2, the risk is high if your parents have it. And especially if your grandparents have it. So the chances are... Two to three times more as compared to the normal population if someone in your family, immediate family, has diabetes. So the person with uh, who is controlled with diabetes, when controlled, suddenly experience increase in the symptoms. What is its sign? Is the sugar that is some new infection or is uh, symptoms have worsened or sugars are not coming? Okay, so in your question itself, Dr. Mm Nanka, -hmm. you mentioned that the person is well controlled and suddenly there has been a surge. surge. Right? Okay. So obviously if the sugars were controlled and suddenly there is a surge, that means there is an event which has occurred. Okay, Now, why the sugar levels can go up? Uh, obviously one, stress. Because when you are stressed, there are certain hormones like cortisol, which is cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which surges in the body, levels of which increase during stress. It is these hormones which does not allow insulin to act and insulin if not able to act, sugar levels go up. So one is the most common thing is stress. Number two, in a person who is known diabetic, if the levels go up suddenly, then one should look for some infection or inflammation somewhere in the body. Most common cause is either a lower respiratory tract infection or a lower urinary tract infection. So either infection or inflammation or stress or in a person who is known diabetic on medication, the sugars may increase suddenly probably because either the patient or the individual has missed his medications or has indulged in dietary indiscretion or probably has skipped his exercises. So probably these are the three most common reasons in a known diabetic, why does sugar suddenly go up? As we've been talking about infection, why is it that females with diabetes have more urinary tract infection as compared to males? Okay, so remember one thing: in a diabetic, if in a diabetic, if your sugars are not controlled or if your blood glucose levels are high, this glucose from the bloodstream spills over into the urine. So the urine is sweet. Obviously, it acts like a nidus for infection. Now this can be true in men as well as in women. But why only women get more infection? That's because in women, the urethra is straight. There is no curvature. So it's straight and it's short. And obviously it lies in close proximity to the vagina. Therefore, females tend to develop urinary tract infection much more commonly than men. We had one question. If I control my sugar management properly, does the risk of developing the heart disease reduce or as we know macrovascular complication will reduce? Well definitely yes. If your glucose levels are well controlled, not only macrovascular risk of getting a heart problem is less, the risk of getting a stroke, risk of getting a gangrene, risk of developing a kidney problem or risk of developing a problem. All these reduce. Micro and micro. So this is whether it's type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. The risk of complications definitely reduce if your glucose levels are well controlled. But there's a trade-off. And the trade-off is walking the tight road. Obviously, by controlling your glucose, one should not be too aggressive in controlling also. And you should not land up with hypoglycemia also. When I say hypoglycemia, I mean low sugars. Obviously, your glucose levels should not be low also. Otherwise, that can also be equally or more detrimental to your health in the short run. Because a high sugar will kill you probably in the long run. A low sugar can be fatal also. Just one episode. So you need to balance the two. And if your glucose levels are well controlled, 
I see no reason why one should get less microvascular or macrovascular complications. Oh, I have a question right now. No? I had gestational diabetes. How soon after giving having the baby I should get my blood glucose rechecked? Okay, that's a very nice question. If you look, gestational diabetes is on a rise. Okay. What do I mean by gestational diabetes? Diabetes which happens or which is first diagnosed during pregnancy. That is called as gestational diabetes. Now, normally, what are normal sugar levels? In a normal, non pregnant state, your fasting glucose levels should be less than 100. And two hours after meals, your glucose levels should be less than 140. This is non pregnant state. Now, when one is pregnant, obviously the sugars are transferred from the mother to the baby. So the mother's glucose levels should also be much lower than what they normally are. So when I say fasting less than 100 and 2 hours after food less than 140, during pregnancy, fasting levels should be less than 90 and 2 hours after food should be less than 120. This is what normal is. When the glucose levels exceeds this threshold, we say that that particular female has, tend to de has developed gestational diabetes. Gestational means there are certain hormones which increase as pregnancy advances and it is these hormones which oppose insulin so the sugars tend to go up. And you look, the frequency of gestational diabetes has definitely gone up. The reason being, most of these girls nowadays at 25 and 30 are overweight and obese, especially Asians. So if your pre-pregnancy weight is high, obviously the belly fat is more, so you tend to you are at a higher risk of developing diabetes. So therefore, the frequency is gone up. Now the question was, okay, at what after delivery when should I check it, right? As I said, this type of diabetes remains only during pregnancy because after delivery, the hormones which oppose insulin, the levels of these hormones go down. So obviously your sugars normalize once you deliver. But then it indicates that such an individual is more prone to develop diabetes subsequently in life if they do not control weight. So they need to reduce their weight after delivery. And the weight reduction should be almost less than what their pre-pregnancy weight was. So the first time after delivery that they should check it should be probably at three month interval. So one should get their fasting plasma glucose, postprandial glucose and HB A1C checked three months after delivery once you had a gestational diet. Because not only you are prone to develop that uh, gestational diabetes and subsequent pregnancies, there is a 50% chance that in the next five years you may get de develop frank diabetes if your weight is not controlled. You know, so in India, earlier when people used to deliver 8 times, 9, nine times, nine. 10 times. So then uh, that time they used to feed after delivery laddus and methis and this and that full of jaggery, fully loaded. And that tradition still goes on. You know, even when you are delivering one or two cakes and you tend to put on more and more weight so your sugars will go up further. So that's why the prevalence of diabetes is on the rise. And that's precisely why we are here. So, you know, 14th November, why it's, I would say not celebrated, but why it's designated as World Diabetes Day, the only aim is to increase the awareness so that we can reduce this epidemic of diabetes. So the awareness should be there. So, we are here to propagate the awareness. As we are talking about gestational diabetes, if a mother is a gestational diabetes, is the kid or the child born to get the diabetes, or what are the chances of getting diabetes? Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, gestational diabetes, if an individual or a female has gestational diabetes, uh, the risk of the kid getting diabetes is almost similar to what a normal pregnant female's offspring will be. So, it's not that the kid has higher chance of developing diabetes. No, this is almost similar to any other female who does not have diabetes during pregnancy. So, just mere presence of gestational diabetes does not or is not a risk factor for the kid developing diabetes. However, what has been noted is that if the mother's sugar levels are on the upper side during pregnancy or if the sugar levels are uncontrolled, 
then there can be some problems with the kids. And what are the so if you look, why we say that the sugar levels during pregnancy should be controlled? Because if the sugars are uncontrolled, then this sugar gets transferred from the mother to the baby. So obviously if the baby is getting too much of sugar in the womb of the mother, then the babies will become large. Obviously if the baby is large, then how long can the mother retain it? Usually it cannot be full 9 months. So they have increased risk of preterm delivery. If you try and deliver these kids normally through the vagina, these kids can end up with shoulder fracture because they are huge. Obviously the risk of preterm is more, the risk of C-sections, LSCS or cesarean sections is much more in these kids. Another thing which has been observed is, now when the sugar levels in the baby are also high, in order to digest the sugar, the baby's body, whenever the pancreas is developed, the baby's body tends to produce more and more insulin. But when the cord is clamped, the transfer of the sugar is not happening. If, if sugar, sugar is not getting transferred from the mother to the baby, <coughs> because the cord is clamped, but the baby's body continues to produce more insulin, anticipating more glucose will come. But that doesn't happen. So the baby's sugar levels after birth can go down and babies can end up with low sugar and convulsions. And also in the long run it has been seen that these kids who are exposed to more glucose in the intrauterine phase, later on in life when they are out they tend to eat more, they are more overweight and obese, they tend to develop more hypertension, Diabetes, vestibulum, much much earlier, heart problems much much earlier. Very so important to have a tight glycemic control in pregnancy. That's why. So that's why more and more emphasis on you yes. know gestational diabetes, and it's not gestational diabetes. Overall, the kind of lifestyle that we all are living, especially in metros, I think. And nowadays, earlier we used to think that you know, it's diabetes is just limited to metros, but now that thing is also spreading to rural areas because there's plenty and abundant of food available we can afford that also and uh, physical activity has gone down so we are trying to be more and more obese and overweight individuals that's and that's why more and more problems so it's simple thing you take fat you get more fat and you get 30 more problems with it the next question we have, can women with diabetes breastfeed their babies? Yes, definitely. Breastfeeding is, should be done and it's good. Human milk has a lot of uh, immunogenic pro properties, uh, anti-infective properties and breastfeeding is no contraindication, just mere presence of diabetes whether type 1 or type 2 is not a contraindication of, for breastfeeding. One should definitely breastfeed for at least Six months. We had one question from Shimona. How can I know my sugars are too high or too low, or if either? Okay. Now, uh, it's a good question. Now, as I, as I said, uh, usually whether the sugars are high or low, one may not necessarily experience anything. Or in terms of symptoms, one may complain of giddiness weakness, tiredness, letharginess, uh, weight loss, increased frequency of urination. You know in the night especially when you have to get up to pass urine maybe three or four times, then that should be an alarm for you. That probably your sugar levels are high. On the other hand, when your sugars are low, one can experience palpitations, heart beating fast, excessive sweating, giddiness, uneasiness, you feel hungry, you tend you want to you crave for food. So these are usual symptoms of a low sugar. So, irrespective, there can be some overlap for a high sugar or a low sugar. It's best to check it whenever in doubt. Better to check it whenever in doubt. If, uh, we have next question. If the glucose levels are okay, can the treatment be stopped? Okay, that's a very important and relevant question. You know, so one needs to understand whether the glucose levels are normal because of lifestyle or whether you are on medications. If you think that the medications are the real reason why your sugar levels have normalized, one can attempt under medical supervision 
to reduce the dosages of medicines and then see what happens to the sugar levels. If you tend to completely stop it, then probably your sugar levels are bound to go up again if lifestyle is not met. So it would all depend on what medications brought it down or whether it's the lifestyle which is brought it down. Yeah, next question. I have type 2 diabetes. Will I have to go on insulin? Okay, uh, so that's why uh, the current classification is type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Earlier classification was insulin dependent or non-insulin dependent. That created a lot of confusion. Remember, for type 1, all patients have to be on insulin. The oral drugs do not work. These oral drugs that we give usually go in the, pan go in the body, stimulate the pancreas to produce more and more of insulin. So, for how long can the pancreas produce more and more? Eventually, after 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, the pancreas may not necessarily be able to produce insulin. And the effect or the efficacy of these medications tend to reduce over a period of time. And then, probably these individuals may require additional insulin. Therefore, type 1 diabetes will definitely require insulin. Type 2 may also require insulin if lifestyle is not met. So I think the crux which we often tend to forget is lifestyle. Because ultimately, diabetes is nothing but an acquired disorder. It is we who got it. It's an acquired disorder. Your genes may predispose you to develop diabetes. But not necessarily that everyone who is predisposed genetically develops diabetes until and until he or she indulges into an inappropriate lifestyle. So we say is the genes which load the gun, is the environment which pulls the trigger. So it's an acquired disorder precisely. You maintain a discipline in your life, you maintain a balance, then you stay away from doctors and not stay away from diseases. <laughs> okay, we have one question. I had diabetes when I was pregnant. Now I am pregnant again. How often should I monitor my blood glucose? Okay, so we are again on gestational yes, diabetes. Gestation. So, so you know, uh, the opposition to <laughs> insulin or the uh, hormones which contract the insulin, their levels go up, especially during the 30 to 34th week of pregnancy. And this is the time when your sugar levels tend to be much, much more. So, frequency of monitoring would depend on what your sugar levels are. There is no universal guidelines on how frequent do you check during pregnancy. Some people advocate three times, some people would say six times. And if your glucose levels are not controlled, probably seven times also. So you need to really individualize based on what your readings are and what your profile is. I cannot make a general statement to four times or five times. But definitely three times is the must, at least. As we we'll talking about checking, how often a type 2 diabetes get a routine evaluation check? So, a walk up done for them. So, if you look at uh, what guidelines recommend and what we follow in practice, one should check their sugar levels, that is fasting, post prandial and HbA1c, at least once in three months. At least. Obviously, if you are on insulin, I would probably say that you should check your sugar levels probably once a week. But if you are on oral drugs, then probably uncontrolled once in a month at least. If controlled, probably once in three months. So sugar levels should be checked frequently. But when you are looking at diabetes management, it's not just the glucose control. We are looking at presence of complications also. So the microvascular complications that we were talking of, that is kidneys, kidneys eyes, eyes and the nerves. So the eye checkup should be done at least once in a year. And when I say eye checkup, we are really not interested in the numbers the vision. or vision. What we are interested in is the retina or the blood vessels of the retina. So one should get an eye checkup from an ophthalmologist and not an optometrist. Because it's not the numbers, it's the retina that we are interested in once in a year. One should get a foot assessment or neuronal examination, nerve examination once in a year. And for kidneys, you should check the creatinine once in six months. And you should look out at the urine for loss of proteins once in three months at least.
1-3 Yeah. And then the other macrovascular complications, depending upon your profile, whether you should go in for an ECG, 2 d echo, or cardiac workup, depending upon what your risk profile is. There is no age cutoff for this. If your risk is high to develop a cardiac event, you can undergo investigation even at 30 or 35. If you have a strong family history, if you are smoking, if you are consuming a lot of alcohol, you are overweight, and have a strong family history of premature, Heart problems, you can go in for that checkup much earlier. Uh, Mr. Rakesh Reddy, will insulin make me gain weight? Most common question we have. Yes, so insulin is nothing but a hormone and uh, it's an anabolic hormone. So that causes weight gain and that has the potential to cause low sugar also. Yes, insulin does cause weight gain over a period of time because obviously this weight gain is because the insulin is working so you tend to develop more of muscle mass and you tend to develop more of fat mass you develop more muscle as well as fat on insulin therapy okay is it very difficult a patient with to type 2 diabetes to have a normal routine life and not at all i think for type 2 diabetes it's much much easier the only advantage that i see of diabetes or type 2 diabetes is that it can make you disciplined provided you want to. So you can control your meals, you can time them well, you can quantify them, you can regulate on the quality also and you can live a healthy life, you can exercise. So if you want, the lifestyle can be absolutely normal and you can be disciplined. So they are nowhere behind nothing. Not at all. So Not at all. In fact, the problem is in type 1 diabetes uh, because the quality of life actually suffers in type 1 diabetes. Remember, type 1 diabetes is young kids. Yeah. Now, in young kids, to restrict and limit diet is something which is difficult. Remember, these are school going kids. So, how do you manage their insulin in school? How do you manage their diet in school? Regulate that is difficult. Also, after school, they like to play outdoors. So, that time, what do we do? So, the quality of life, obviously. In type 1, it's much more effective than type 2. Nevertheless, as I said earlier, there are celebrities, even from India, who made their mark in spite of type 1 diet. So, so type 1 should be more guided about how to take calorie counting and everything? Yes, definitely. Uh, type 1 diabetes, and these are kids now, so they are more willing to understand, improve on life also. They are more receptive unlike a type 2 individual because for type 2 their priorities are different and not just lifestyle. They have their responsibilities also. Somewhere diabetes comes down the list because they just feel that it's number game. It's not causing a problem. But once you remember it's not causing a problem now but later on it can definitely affect. Once your complications start then obviously you are too late because you missed the boat. How long does it take for years to, for the uncontrolled diabetes for the complications to set in? So in type 1 diabetes, uh, complications can start only after about 5 years or so if you are uncontrolled or poorly controlled. But for type 2 diabetes, the complications can start right at the time of diagnosis because these are individuals who may probably have high glucose levels and they don't have symptoms so they do not even check for years. And just because either of some camp or someone asked them to check, they check. So they can have complications right at the time of diagnosis. Uh, we have a question by Rahul Sharma. I am skinny, so can I get diabetes? Okay, so if you have less fat mass, then probably your potential or risk for type 2 diabetes is much, much less. Because it's the fat which is causing type 2 diabetes. Nevertheless, even in thin and lean individuals, one can get diabetes if you are genetically prone for. If your body is not generating adequate insulin, which usually happens in type 1 diabetes, if you are genetically more prone, then you have the potential to develop diabetes, though not type 2. So we have one question, how are diabetes and heart disease related or why do diabetics have silent heart attack, which we come from? Yes. So it's a very intelligent question. Okay, uh, as I said, why do one get heart attacks? Now, diabetes is nothing but increase in blood glucose. And if the glucose levels are high, I'll give you a small example. Okay, what I usually tell my patients, you take two glasses of water. 
in one glass, add sugar, stir it, add maybe half kg sugar and stir it. So this becomes your routine rasgulla water or gulab jamun water. And the other is normal water. Okay. Now, if you were to say which will flow faster? The normal water. Obviously, this will flow slow. No, the flow will be less. Yeah. The reason being that this thick. is more thick, thick and this is more viscous. Thick. So anything which is thick, the flow will be slow and sluggish. Same thing happens in diabetes. When your blood sugar levels are high, the blood becomes more thick. Any liquid, more thick it is, the sluggish will its flow be. So then the heart will have to apply more pressure to pump. So the blood pressure goes up. Right? Now, just put your finger, dip your finger in the two glasses. Which will be sticky? The one with sugar. Obviously, the one with sugar will be more sticky because sugar sticks. Same thing, when the glucose level is high, the sugar will stick on the inner side of a blood vessel. Along with sugar, you have calcium deposition, you have cholesterol deposition. Now, if you are uncontrolled, then obviously imagine the extent of this clogging. Okay, or these particles to get stick on the inner side of the blood vessel. So, the blood vessel eventually, over one year, two years or three years, will choke. And so obviously this is what happens when the blood vessels of the heart are choked or blocked, you get heart attack. This silent. is what happens. Silent. Okay, why is it silent? Okay. The reason being, in diabetes, the nerves are also affected. And it's not only the nerves of the legs which are affected, the okay. nerves which supply the heart muscle also get affected. So you cannot perceive the pain. That's why that's why we say diabetes is a silent killer. I remember my professor telling me, you know, diabetes is nothing but dying in bits. That's why more the awareness, one should be aware of controlling glucose levels. Everything in life should be balanced, neither more nor less. We have one very interesting question. What are the complications of using the birth control pill while having diabetes? So yes, for whatever reason one is using a birth control pill, whether it's for birth control or otherwise also, uh, they tend to increase, estrogen tends to increase the blood glucose levels. So there's a tendency for these pills to increase the blood glucose levels. Marginally, I would say it has a mild to modest effect on your glucose levels. So they can use it or there is no much difference in the blood glucose. No, the blood sugar tends, tends to be slightly on the upper side, maybe by 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter okay. in people who are using it. So you, whether you want to use it, that would depend on how well your sugars are. If you are normal, definitely you can. If your sugars are always 500, 600 and you are using this pills, you can use it. So um, you need to decide what is important. Does menopause affect diabetes? Menopause affecting diabetes. Obviously, menopause, I would say it's not a direct effect, but an indirect effect. During menopause, because of sudden decline in estrogen progesterone levels, there are a lot of mood swings. And obviously, because of mood swings, your diet pattern may change. One can go into depression, maybe tend to overeat, one can go into psychosis, one can become more, the intake of food can be more. Apart from that, your activity levels will also vary. So, indirectly, menopause can definitely affect your glucose levels. Okay. Uh, we have a very common question coming up during Ramadan. Mm -hmm. How to control diabetes? Or do, do what to be done during that time? So, I think probably this Ramadan I was on Facebook like that time also. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Ramadan is a festival, very pious uh, festival. And uh, during that period, uh, obviously, uh, one eats only from evening till morning, okay, from dusk to dawn, and that is the time during daytime you are starving, and your water intake is also not there. So there is a risk of dehydration. So we usually advise people who are diabetics to avoid fasting and feasting, whether it's during Ramzan or whether it's during Pajusha, okay, or during Navratri for that matter. So usually the first victim in diabetes is to avoid fast and to avoid feast. However, we never ever stop people from practicing their religious belief. 
okay and following their faith so if, if at all you really want to go ahead with fasting then what we do is we need to modify your medications you need to switch over to med medicines which are short acting and then you need to modify the timing also give more medications at night time and give very very mild or no medications during early morning because then the person is not going to eat for a longer duration so it's better so i think during such period if at all you want to fast it's better to go to your doctor and seek medical help yeah it's always better we are very interested because you need to individualize sir i'm addicted to maybe coffee i take it at least twice a week I don't know whether make tea, coffee. I don't, I'm not aware of any such research incriminating make tea coffee as a causative factor for diabetes. So I'm not really aware of tea causing like diabetes per se. I don't think so. If you ask me personally, okay. unless and until you probably are adding too much sugar and consuming whole lot of things along with it. We have a question from Shama Raj. He is 36, 66 years, and 66 years can diabetes go away, or any age above that? No age. Once you've got diabetes, the only way it can go is either if you lost good amount of weight, if you cut down on the fat, or you've undergone some procedure and you've lost weight. The second type cause why your sugars may normalize. If you were a diabetic. and now you notice that your sugars have started normalizing your weight is same but your sugars have started normalizing mm -hmm. then one of the important thing is to monitor your kidney functions that means probably if your kidneys are damaged if your creatinine levels have gone up and the kidneys are damaged sugars tend to normalize at that point that's the sign of the kidney disease yes sugars are like if you were diabetic for a long long time and uncontrolled probably and now suddenly for no apparent reasons your sugars have started normalizing and your medications have also gone down then probably one needs to monitor the kidney functions and looking for any kidney damage because when your kidneys are damaged the insulin which your body is producing or the medications which you are taking remain in circulation for a longer longer time and the effect is getting magnified therefore the sugars are normalizing so you need to monitor your kidney so these are the only two conditions Apart from a few others. Okay, we'll come up with the last question. What are the healthy glucose levels? We've been talking about what are the complications, but what are the healthy glucose levels? Okay, as I said, in normal individuals, fasting less than hundred, and when I say fast, means eight hours of fast is good enough. You can take water during this period, but no calories. So eight hours of fast, and if your glucose levels are less than hundred, that means you're normal. You consume the glucose that is 75 grams glucose, or you consume some food, and you check your sugar levels after two hours. And if it is less than 140, that means you are normal. You do a test called as HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin, and if it is less than 5.5, that is normal. So this is normal. Anything which in a fasting state, if your glucose levels are more than or equal to 126 mg per deciliter or 2 hours after food more than or equal to 200 mg per deciliter or your glycosylated hemoglobin or hba1c more than or equal to 6.5% that means i can easily label this person as a diabetic to have diabetes so something between them that means if my fasting is between 100 to 125 Or two hours after food, One. if my sugars are 141 to 199, or my three months average HbA1c is 5.7 to 6.4, that means I am a pre-diabetic. One step ahead of normal and one step behind diabetes. So this is a group pre-diabetes which is much much more receptive, and they have a 50% chance to move on to getting frank diabetes if they do not cut down their weight. and a 50% chance to move back into normal c if they reduce weight and whether they go forward or go back depends on which lifestyle they adopt so that brings me to very important thing which i would like to say that between b and d that is between birth to death 
C is always there. And the C stands for the choice that you make. A very important thing. It is you who decide what type of life you want to live. A good life, a healthy life, or a life full of complications, full of problems, especially medical, with frequent hospitalization. So I think the ch choice is the most important thing between birth and death, which one needs to look at. Okay. So we are a very informative level. Hopefully informative, I'm not too sure. <laughs> On the world diabetes day by Dr. Girish Prana. We are happy to help. I, I think we have answered most of the questions by the people. So any last words by sir? So I think uh, this, is an, this is an important, uh, I would say, condition and not a real disease. It's a condition or a state which can change if you choose an appropriate healthy lifestyle. And I think uh, as awareness increases, we should all resolve today on 14th November that let's fight it out. And this year's theme is family and diabetes. So we should all ensure that our family members, those who are diabetics, should be well controlled and stay fit should have minimal or no complications at all. And those who are non diabetics, let us all resolve that we obviously do not progress in that front. So I think choosing a healthy lifestyle, balancing your work as well as lifestyle is the most important thing that we should adopt. So that was the last message by Dr. Dr. Thank you so much. Questions, if any, I'll be happy to answer on my mail. Probably my mail is we are Girish21 at yahoo.co.in so you or you can come on to the Nanavati website and probably mail us. Yeah. Thank you very very much.